said after pipeline it was to have more than one pipeline. And um, usually you have one general purpose pipeline that is the same as all the previous. So architecture version and you have one special purpose pipeline for structures that we profile and hold and for the use very often. Um, the problem is you still need to compile and it still sucks on the structure with a few registers. So this is what all the CPUs do, but um, you miss. The brick wall, you can increase performance and definitely increase message, especially if your instruction set only has a 9 or a general purpose. Next step was to complete the asymptotic What you do is you fetch many instructions and then distribute them into functional units on the CPU, which is very complex. There's a dependency graph inside the CPU and um, it, it still has problems if you have a few registers, but you can immediately deal with that with shadow registers. So modern CPUs, even the Intel ones, have something like 100 internal registers, and if you have a tight loop, the CPU will try to run more than one iteration of the loop at the same time and rename the registers internally. And as you can imagine, this is very complex and expensive, and you can get around the to the register part a little, but you know, in the end it still does a cover for things like K2 decoding. Register renaming is the process of the shadow registers. The, the number of shadow registers varies widely from architecture to architecture. Um, the, the biggest count I've heard so far was over 200. So you can see the CPU are getting very complex. And all of this is done. To, to work on many data at the same time. So the, the obvious step would be to allow the programmer to say when he wants to operate on an array, many, on many um, elements in an array at the same time, and the obvious thing to do with vector instructions. Um, I'm talking here about vector extensions to normal processes, but we actually did have vector processes, early array processes, for example, where all the vector processes. So the, the idea to use vectors is really old, but to have a general purpose CPU that also does registers as an extension is um, not so old. The problem is to use this, um, the iterations from the loop have to be independent, which is not always the case. And if the architecture has really few registers, you end up not being able to express your algorithm in the inner loop in a way that makes it possible for the CPU to understand it is independent. If you run out of registers in your loop and you write a read to temporary temp variables on the stack, then the CPU will not be able to use register renaming to unroll the loop while it is executing the program. So architectures with very few registers are still out of line with this uh, the, the obvious uh, way out of this would be to add more registers, but we usually can't do that without breaking all the tools and the instructions that on the CPU. So um, there are simulations about how many registers are optimal for a CPU and simulations have shown that it's about 32 registers. Actually 16 is, all, is also okay but no that 16 is bad. So um, it doesn't make sense to have more than 32 registers. Usually there are exceptions like Spark and IA64 but uh, x86 only has 7 registers problem for exploiting parallelism. Um, normally CPUs are fast enough, only for a few special jobs they are not fast enough, and these special jobs are usually involving floating point calculation, which is done by audio encoding or um, compiling software is integer only most of the time. So we're not going to improve this with vector instructions, but vector instructions are about maybe a CPU that's good for number crunching. That's it means in, in every sense that is visible in benchmarks we need better floating point performance. And there are several ways to get better floating point performance out of CPUs. The obvious one is to use a better floating point unit, that's very low latency. The problem is there's an obvious bound here and how fast you can go. Um, this depends on the algorithms that are known that you can use. There are some trade-offs you can do, you can add big tables to your units and then um, I have some examples for this data. So there are tricks you can do, but you can make it. You can make every floating point operation in constant time and very quick. So um, 
The other thing you can do to reduce latency is you reduce the work of floating point when it is moving. Alpha has done some very uh, nice tricks in this area, but they did is they um, made it optional for your software to disable the several things that make floating points um, hardware expensive and complex and slow. And one of the things is they defer the normalization of the floating point numbers, which is not IEEE compliant, but uh, on Alpha you say if I want the performance, I don't care. It, Okay. Another thing you can do is add is precise interrupts, uh, precise exception inside the CPU, which will also greatly um, increase the speed of floating point. Um, and these are things that you can do with Alpha. You can also disable this, but then the floating point will be much lower. So, what most high performance people do is say, I don't care if it's IEEE floating point or not, as long as the results are okay and it's quick. So, this can be done in some cases, and others is not good. And the, the next approach will obviously be to add more floating point units. And if the CPU is asynchronous on the inside, you can have more uh, instructions handled by different units. The problem is the x86 architecture does not have floating point registers in the resistance, but it doesn't have a stack. So every floating point operation always uses the uppermost element on the floating point stack, and it's impossible to express parallel algorithms or have any parallelism at all in your algorithms with this uh, floating point architecture. So any more floating point units did not have on the internal hardware at all. And the, the, the short answer was to add some floating point vector uh, operations, but the long answer was to um, make it possible to use the SSD extensions to do scalar math, normal scalar math as on list architectures with normal addressable registers. So that's one of the big points why SSD is so uh, popular in this day, because compilers can just use it to do normal non-vector scalar math um, and use normal list style addressing, which makes it possible to express the parallelism in the algorithm better. It still helps only if your algorithm is, is parallelizable at all, which is not always the case, but in most number crunching areas it is the case. Um, usually the state of the art in making number crunching CPUs is all on execution, which is quite expensive on the hardware side, but it is, has good, uh, good performance. And the obvious advantage of all the other execution is that the compiler doesn't have to be very smart. It just has to write down the, the code. It doesn't have, even have to unroll loops because your processor has all the hardware to do virtual unrolling while executing the loop. So this is good if you are if you want to save the money on the compilers. And this is um, this is popular because some companies have failed miserably with architectures just because their compilers suck. And the most prominent example obviously is Intel. They had one architecture called um, EI860 which was very, um, very innovative for its time. I have later a slide about it. But it failed completely because they could not deliver a compiler that could generate good code for the architecture. And IA64 does have the same problems right now. So it is important to have, a, if, you, if you have a new platform and you want to push it into the market, it's important that the performance is right, even if the compiler sucks. So that's why our whole execution is very popular. But the number one performance killer in the CPUs are branches. It turns out that um, branches are not so common in floating point code because what floating point code normally does is has some loops of fixed length. One of the most important uh, number crunching stuff you will see is um, fast create transforms and discrete cosine transforms, and those use loops, but the loops have a fixed size, so you can unroll them completely and you have a long patch of floating point instructions without any branches at all. So the branch stuff is very important in general for CPUs, but not for number crunching floating point stuff. Um, so the, the first important question actually is why add vector extensions at all? Um, it turns out that in many cases you don't need vector extensions. I will have a slide later how you can emulate vector extensions style programming without having a vendor uh, vector extension. But uh, it turns out that it can be added without any cost. It's just uh, all you do, for example, the, it's obvious if you have big 
um, big machine words like 128 bits, wide machine words, um, you're still going to be able to do the logical bitwise operations like XOR, AND, or SHIFT, stuff like that you can do no matter how wide the word is. So if you have big words like 128 bits, there are probably any applications that can make use of that for the normal uh, programming, but if you say like partition the big word into smaller words and then you can have the same operation for X or N, it doesn't matter if it's partition logically into small integers, the operation stays the same. Now, um, any is a little more complex, but if you look at how adders work in CPUs, um, making it possible to partition the word actually just means not signaling the carry bit at the partitioning sites, which is really cheap to add in hardware, you don't have to do much for it. So the first vector extensions that were available actually only added the store at all shifting, maybe, and some don't even have adding. But it's still, um, you can still have some benefit from it just by having big words and the logical operations. But as I said, adding is very cheap to add in hardware. Subtracting is the same as adding, basically. And um, that's basically how it started. The vendors saw that it can be added without any cost. So it might be possible to um, increase the speed of some vector extension um, stuff. First thing that was done was, was uh, texturing in 3D graphics. The, the, when, at the time when the first vector extensions to general purpose CPUs appeared on the market, was the time when the, the demo and graphics and the art people started putting textures on the graphics. And there were no 3D accelerators for the general public and for public universities. So that was the killer application at first for vector operations. So if we have adding in um, for partition words, subtracting is trivial, you just add the negated word. And negating is also quite easy, it's a small with a constant and different. So all of these instructions can basically be done in one machine cycle no matter how, how wide the word is. And um, because the, the real estate of the CPU does not only mean how much space you have for your register file, but also you need for every bit in every register, you need one line, one signal line on the CPU. It's, it is a space question. You can have arbitrarily many CPU registers because it will increase and make the routing on the CPU more expensive to uh, manufacture. So there are um, limits to how many registers you want and how wide you want to register. Um, but it is basically free to add a single vector extension like this. Um, the historical perspective, this is a trick question obviously, um, was not ever made. But many people think the first vector extension on the general market was MMX, and maybe someone knows an extension that was earlier than MMX. Anyone? No, I think it was even later. Pentium um, MMX was the first one that has any marketing effort behind it. The, it. It was announced in 1996 and it was shipped in 1997, but Previously, Sun had added some visual instruction set they called it, so also a, a trivial integer vector extension. And it was shipped in 1995, and they used it for real time vector decoding and encoding. And um, HP is rumored to be even quicker. It was also in 1995, and several sites credited them for being the first CPU, desktop CPU, relative vector extensions, but the first CPU at all with uh, partitioning in the integer registers was Internet the I86 I mentioned before, which was in 1989. So it, it actually was a very cool CPU if you don't have some time left and I interested in computer architecture, I challenge you to go to Google and ask for I86. Um, it was the first super scalar CPU and the first CPU with multiply add instructions in one cycle. And they also had pipelining which had been enabled at this element. Very crappy CPU and it had no chance in the market because the text compiler sucked. So, vector extensions are good and you can reap some big benefits from them, but um, still, it is still important that people can write normal software with normal compilers on the platform. Um, 
the applications that, that obviously benefit the most from vector extensions are image operations. So if you want to do stuff like an, an alpha channel or let some some icon put some icon half semi transparent on the background on the desktop, stuff like that is called alpha channel, we have transparency in the images. And this is obvious obviously the perfect example for vector extensions because every pixel is not dependent on the other pixels around it, so you can operate on them independently. And these operations, image operations, usually also need saturation, which is an important term in computer graphics, because it means if you have a white pixel and you add it to a blue pixel, white, the white pixel has all values to the max. So if you add blue to white, what will happen is that you get an overflow and the example is still blue. So adding is not enough to, to um, actually add images visually, but you have to have saturation. If it's already white, don't wrap around. This is called saturation. And by the example here, adding 5, which is a very small value to a value that's already almost white, does not go higher than white. The, the normal adding function would wrap around to zero. So this is also something that, that vector operations, that image operations normally use and if you write it in C normally what you do is you have an if clause for each pixel which makes one branch and it's very, uh, it's, it's hard to predict for the CPU and it makes it very slow to have branches. So um, if you have a vector extension that can do act editing on, on pixels in parallel, this is some obvious thing you might want to add, add in saturation. So back to number crunching. When you have an Xbox edit, I don't know how many of you already had Intel computers then or x86 computers, the worst bottleneck was graphic speed, stuff like adding textures to, to games and 3D graphics. Um, so the, the texturing was very important and Intel said MMX is good for graphics. But what happened is that uh, 3D graphics on the desktop PC started to emerge. And for 3D graphics, um, it is not only important to be able to draw the textures, but you have all the, the um, floating point transforms of the points. It's vector graphics, it's all vector graphics, so it's obviously not kind of vector extended for this too. But it's not integer arithmetic, it's floating point arithmetic, and then the was basically useless, um, useless for this. So that's why there was a small market niche for free now. But Actually, having integer vectors is not, all, it's not completely bad if you want to do floating point stuff because it's um, one optimization technique that is, has been known for years, for decades, um, is to reformulate your algorithm so that, it, that all the values fit in integers. Because all CPUs before, I think the Pentium 2 made the difference, all CPUs before that, um, the floating point hardware was, if it was there at all, it that it was much slower than integer arithmetic. So much work has been done to write um, algorithms in integer arithmetic. And since the X can do integer arithmetic, there is surprisingly uh, much stuff that you can accelerate with MMX alone. And what, what surprised me the most is that usual MPEG 2 decoding, video decoding, is completely integer only. Um, if you read the standard, you will see that it is floating point all the time. So this is kind of surprising if you have to use vector extensions before, but many problems can be formulated completely if it's only. So this is still important, but it didn't have weight, and that's why it makes sense kind of a bad name. Um, but as I said, it turns out that it takes two video recording, which is the killer application for PCs, even now if you want to play the DVDs in the meantime on their PCs. It can be done completely in an integer mark and like most printing algorithms it's highly parallelized. But these days um, the, the floating point, the non-vector floating point I should say is faster than non-vector integer mark. If you use the vector extension it really is a matter of how many elements you fit in each vector. Not so much whether you use floating point or integer. Um, Still, the, the most, most modern vector extension on x86 is SSD2, and they have 128 bit registers for floating point and integer mark. And you can see if you use floats, that those use 32 bits. So
So you get four flows at the same time in one vector. And if you can reformulate your problem, if you do 16 bit integral, you have twice as many elements at the same time. So this is obviously important. This is more important than whether you use floating point or integer, it's how many elements you can use at the same time. There are many different vector extensions. These are the NDS 86 ones that are available right now. Um, and an extra integer operations on 64 bit vectors, which were huge at the time. And now we want to have 128 bit vectors. And for, for backwards compatibility reasons, they met those registers on the floating point registers, which are also 64 bits. And they did that so the operating systems would not have to be modified to support task switching without corrupting the other tasks registers. And looking backwards, this was a huge mistake and Apple is still making fun of Intel for this decision. Um, but they had their reasons probably. So um, anyway, 3D now is basically MMX, but they also have instructions to use the MMX registers as vectors of two flows. And um, as you can see, the speed up can, can be at most two in this case, but it still helped a lot. Uh, really now was really um, important once because, because it was the first vector extensions that was used by 3D games, 3D engines like and Quake and Unreal, and you could really see the difference. Even if you um, only have a speed up of two, you, you, you can vectorize a whole program. You can only use your profile or debugger and find the, the places where you think um, it's most important. And you, if you can gain a factor of two at these places and the whole of Quake speeds up by 20%, it's really easier. So, this is important. The next step was SSD. What they did is they added a separate register file, so they undid the mistake of the mix and broke all the operating systems. And surprisingly, it was a matter of days for them all to support this. So, um, what they do is they add wider registers and you can have. 8 bytes in one of these characters. So this is, um, no, actually 16, right? Confused now. Anyway, you can have 4 for the vertical floats in it, which is um, twice the throughput of 3D now. And you can even have two doubles at the same time. Most of the, the simulation in the high energy fields. And, and nuclear, whatever simulation, they insist on using bubbles. So if you tell them that it will be much faster, you know that they don't care. So for those people, even the double arithmetic is accelerated by SSD. But in practice, in most games and, and in VR applications don't put all the precision, so they need to close. SSD also adds a few more integral instructions on the analytics registers, uh, which turn out to be really important. And this only becomes usable if you use these instructions basically. The, the next step was Pentium 4, and they add SSC2, which adds vector instructions for integers at 128 bits as well. There are many different risk integer architectures, most of them you probably have never heard of. The most important one is Alibek from Motorola, and they also have 128 bit vectors, and they can do floats as integer with it right from the start. And since I didn't mention before, but the Intel um, MMX instruction and the SSD only have 8 registers each, which is normally enough because in each vector you have many different variables. So, what would look like using 32 um, values, if you fit many of them inside a vector, if you only use like 8, eight of them. But in the long term, in the long run, um, the more registers you have, um, the more probable it is that your CPU can again start unrolling your vectorized groups for you. So it is, it is technically better to have these, although the current generation of CPUs does not use this yet. Um, even Alpha has support for vectorizing, but it's only for integers, and it is the normal registers, which already are 64 bits wide in Alpha, and it can do really only few things, but um, these few Edit instructions were enough to make it possible for the monitoring by the others to the first time without the CPU to decode that into and even encode that into in real time. So
So what they, what they did, and many of these instructions had started that, like, um, that they asked their impact to and video conferencing to which instructions to use most, and those I added them. And there are some very strange instructions. Um, I will have a few examples. So you can see, although all these instructions have basically do the same on the different architectures, um, the details are very different. And that means not only um, that you have to use assembly to uh, get the optimal performance, it also means you can have something like a C wrapper or a, a platform independent library that always uses the vector instructions at, the, at their best, but you, you um, every vendor has some C extension, so you can use the vector library, or some has a C folder library to use the vector extension. But um, since the, the instructions are different in detail, you can write a program that runs optimal on every platform. So there currently is no cross platform API to use vector extensions in C. HP Max was the, the first one, as I said. Uh, Max 2 is the next generation, they only operate at 16 bit values. You can see that that may be way less what they offer compared to, to the Intel stuff, but um, they do have edge shift and the logical operation, of course. Pack and shuffle, I will show in the slides of this list. Spark also has visual instructions, and what they do is add, but no saturation, which is kind of funny because this is very important for Epic 2. I think they just and then we'll probably, looking um, backward, was probably one of the biggest mistakes with this, this architecture. They also have absolute difference, which kind of looks interesting, right? If you want that, why not add absolute and subtract and then the probably use absolute difference. I said these, these instructions that usually happen with one marketing guy or one executive going to the MP2 programming team and asking them what they need most. And one of the, the very foundations of MP2 encoding is finding the sum of absolute differences. So you can see which child you compress over the other one. So you have the least difference. This is very important. This is the number one CPU performance killer in MP2 encoding. So this taking the sum of absolute differences is a very important operation. And that's why they added one instruction for it. Um, the instruction sets are mostly named here for curiosity. The only ones you really should know if you care about the subject at all are Altebeck and the various x86 extensions, uh, because those are the ones that are actually used, obviously. And I will focus on these for now. If you want to see how these vector extensions are used in the real world, I suggest the best open source place to, to see a widely imported and optimized source code is FFmpeg, which is the codec library used by Mayer and Sun and uh, most other open source video players. And they have a, a, an interesting um, build system that can have exactly optimized versions of, li of library functions for different platforms. And I have a small list of the platforms they support here, which is really amazing that they found people who even know how to use Spark for this. So, but if you want to see how, how your um, favorite vector extension is used in practice, go to the FFFF CES repository. And you can even see PlayStation 2 optimized and handcrafted assembly operations there. So, it is an eye opener. What can you typically, typically do with Zindi? Uh, obviously, the, the logical operations are given, but adding and subtracting values of lights, short, and integers is really the bread and butter function of, of the vector operations. Um, most architectures add a version of saturation. I will have an example where this is important besides integer operations. We'll use that um, in the future. Then there are comparison operators, but if you think about it, you have uh, a register with not one, but four values in it. How can you compare them and get one result? So it's, it doesn't make sense to say compare and set a flag so I can do a conditional jump. So what these, what these comparison instructions do is and you get, you have two input vectors, you say what you want to compare, you have a third 
the result vector. And if for this, these two, the first elements, the comparison is true in the result vector, the element is set to one, all ones, one bits. And if not, it's set to all zero bits. And if you have that, you can say, and the result to the first one. And if it's true, you get zero in the element. If it's false, you get the, the original content. So this is all, all meant not only to, to be able to compare them at all, but it's to, to reduce branches. Because as I said, for floating point code, branches are not that important. But sometimes you need them, and having 16 branches to operate on 16 pixels will completely negate all the benefits you get from vector extensions in the first place. So um, most of the programming with simple instructions is about trying not to branch at all, trying to find a way to express your problem without branching. Of course, shifting is quite easy to add for, for each GPU, so most vector extensions to have a shift. And they don't shift the elements, but they shift inside each element, obviously. If you want to, to rearrange the elements, that's called shuffling. I mentioned that before. Rearranging the elements is called shuffling, and that's um, an operation that some vector extensions don't offer. So, many Many algorithms that actually are very parallel cannot be expressed with vector extensions because they can shuffle. And this was MMX does not have a shuffle instruction, but only SSE adds it. So many, many interesting and important algorithms like um, the FFT, for example, were only possible with the shuffle instruction from um, SSE. Another thing you usually need in floating point vector code that you also need if you Single instructions is multiply and add. So this is also both multiback and, and the SSD is something like this. And um, as I said, absolute difference, which means the, the absolute of A minus B. Autodeck has this MMX does not. So you can still do it, I will show the next slide, but um, there is no special instruction for it in the MMX. Then taking the minimum and maximum value, there are also tricks to get around this, as there's no instruction for that. Um, packing and unpacking means having a vector of where each element is size 8 bit and you want to promote the, the elements to 16 bit, which obviously means they don't fit in the vector anymore, so there are several varieties of how to promote them. But you need this if you, for example, sum up bytes, which is the sum of absolute difference, I said it's the most important function. If you want to sum up two 8 bits, that means the result needs 9 bits. So you can't just sum them up without um, destroying the, the results. So it's important to promote that to 16 bit beforehand, and this is called unpacking. More important than what you can do is what you cannot do. And the most important thing you cannot do with, with simple instructions is using a value in a table as an index. In, in, um, in the table. So you can't say if you have a vector of four elements, you can't say use each one as an index, look up in the table and put the result back in the vector. This is something no extension has. It doesn't look bad, but most of the time when you start vectorizing code, it is already optimized. And many optimization techniques um, pre-compute tables with partial results and their formulas and then look uh, use the table to look the result up, and if you have code that's optimized like that, you have to go back one step and see what did they put in the table. And it's, it's usually faster with simple instructions to compute the formula yourself than use the table. So this is very important. One thing you cannot do, and another thing you cannot do usually is do operations inside one vector. You cannot use, for example, multiply the second element with the third one. Um, you have to use shuffle and extract one element and write it to a register or to memory. This is really um, it's usually so slow that once you have to do this, you cannot use the simple instructions to speed the whole operation up because the, the part where you multiply the elements together is so slow that it negates the benefit from the optimizations before. Um, and one thing that's really annoying is you cannot get the sum of all the, the eight bytes in one vector. I said the sum of absolute differences is really important. So this is the central part basically of that operation. So there's no operation for that. You have to 
uh, trick around to get that done. And so uh, one example on how to how to vectorize code, I have one function I took from FFMCAC. This is one of the most, um, one of the summed up functions. It's not the sum of absolute differences, but it's the sum of all the all the elements. This is used um, in, in video but also in audio to get the, the energy for the audio sample. So you can see that the tile of 16 times 16 pixels and you want to get the sum of all of them. It's quite, quite easy you see. Um, I show this to, to demonstrate that even on CPUs that do not have simple instructions, you can still do stuff in parallel, but it's a little tricky. So you see what I do here is I get four, four bytes at a time and use logical OS to extract the first and third byte and shift that to the right and then I add the others and if you see that, I, that this operation means there's enough space for the editing not to spill over. This of course only works for unsigned integers but I want to show you that it's possible to do CD operations without CD extensions. The benefit of this kind of fitting is normally quite minimal, but there are cases where even small optimizations are important. But this is the kind of thing you will have to understand this to understand why vector extensions are uh, important. And you see that the end result is that I still have to have a vector in, in V of two 16 bit values. I can't just return V, I have to add them up first. So this is something we will see in the X code. General problem. So this code does not work. I will show you how to write the next code in the first place. This is a, a C extension that was proposed by Intel for their C compiler, but GCC also supports it, GCC 3. Make sure you get the latest version of GCC for this. This is really experimental, really edge stuff. Um, I have a slide with some of the, the problems in the middle too. But you can see there are functions to multimedia extension add pi means uh, i8 means 8 bit integers and p means in parallel. So there are also s i8 which means only at the least the least significant 8 bit. This is the scalar operation. But basically all the functions look like this. And there's a new data type in root 64 which means 64 integer. So what you can see you still have to um, cast around your pointers to get them remove the compiler warnings and the code does not look good. It's not so easy to understand this kind of code. So uh, simply code is basically write only. You will notice that most uh, optimized simply code is heavily commented because even the author thinks he's not going to understand it the next time he's looking at it. Inside the loop you can see I only have one loop now. I don't have a second loop inside it because I unload that loop. Uh, what I do here is I use the same vector add with x and the, uh, the next pixel. And what this code does is it adds the, the 8 byte vectors. I just told you that the poor man is in the code that that's not enough because when I add two 8 bit values, the result needs 9 bits. So while this is almost easy, and, and trivial to write this code, it's also wrong. So we have the overflow, overflow problems inside the uh, inside each element of each vector. And the other thing is there's no instruction to sum up the, the result. If I, I sum it up and I get a vector with, with four or eight in this case um, elements and now I need to, to take the sum of this vector. There is a way to do it but there's no instruction to do it. So this is kind of the first problem you run into when you use the instructions. So the first thing we have to do is make sure there are no overflows inside the, uh, the editing room. And we read 8 bit values, so to make sure there are no overflows, we have to promote that to 16, but 16 bit values. So um, the algorithm for that is we copy the vector. So now we have two copies and one copy, we shift right but not with 8 bit values, but with 16 bit values. So um, the, the registers have no information on how wide the elements in the um, vector are. So you can just, each, each instruction you use to manipulate that vector has included uh, on how big the elements are. So 
if I if I read it as eight bit values and then shift the sixteen bit values, it's okay. There's no no type info for the register. So um, I have a slide that shows this a little easier to understand. But what I basically do is I, I copy it the same thing I did with the full and simply code. I copy one, I copy it once, shift one, and uh, make sure the, the the right half is is set to zero by ending the other copy, and then I can add both. And you can see this is kind of funny. Um, I have an example vector here to show how this works. Um, you read it, you copy it, then the first thing you do is you do an 8 bit shift right. On 16 bit elements, I still write them as 8 bit to see to show you what, what happens. So we have two of them together are, are regarded as one 16 bit element, and if I shift them right by, by 8 bits each time, the left element goes to the right, and then the left element uh, of the result is set to zero. So this is what we, what we do to extract one half of the, the vector elements, and the next is the other copy. The other copy we end with this, this magic value to set the first one to zero. And now, if, if we um, if we start operating on these vectors as if they were 16 bit vectors, we have lots of 16 bit values. The first half is always zero, and uh, now we can add them as 16 bit vector, and then we have one and one So, this kind of trickery is often necessary in the single code to get what you want. And uh, it makes the uh, exciting code quite hard to understand. There are more problems with simply code. Um, one of them is if you start using floating point after using the next registers, uh, you will get a call dump or you get bad values like one number, um, depending on how well written the software is to cope with this. This is because MLX shares the, the, the vector registers with the floating point registers. And you have to say, I'm done with MLX now, go back to floating point, to be able to use floating point code again, and the instruction for that is called ELMS called end multimedia section. Um, this instruction is painfully expensive. You can see six cycles on vector three. If you have a small loop that you vectorize, this may be half of your gains going away just for telling the CPU that you might you will finish now. And the pencil four is even worse, it's 12 cycles. So uh, the, the end result is that you start vectorizing the code in small steps and you see it didn't accelerate anything. Because only if you have larger sections or bigger loops um, that you vectorize, you will really see gains. Um, 3D now saw that this, this six cycles might be a problem and defines a function that not only resets the, the status bit, um, but instead of ELMS, that not zero the contents of the register, so it's faster than the mess. Um, but it's proprietary, so this still sucks and it is a major source of ridicule by the other people on the market. Back to the function we tried to vectorize, we still have the problem that we have a vector at the end and um, we want to add up the elements in the vector. So we can do that unless we can shift the whole vector or rearrange the elements in the vector. This is called shuffling. Permutating the elements in the vector is impossible in the LMX. You, what you can do is you write the vector to memory and then shuffle manually and reload the vector, but that obviously sucks big time, so this is not an option. Um, SSD adds an instruction instruct that looks really interesting. If you see a disassembly of someone else's MLX code, um, you will see strange constants like 1B, and I try to explain here how the constants work. You have an 8 bit constant and one source register, and each two bits in the 8 bit register. And the 8 bit immediate value says which index you want in the vector. Uh, this actually works the same way for Altibet, but what the compilers do is they add some pre processing to, to make it easier to, to write this. But if you disassemble other people's code to understand it and you see constants like, like 1b, um, then you end up writing the binary to understand what the shuffle actually does. So shuffling is possible, and you can just permutate, you can also. Uh, for example, set every element in one vector to the first one. So this is also useful for other purposes than just shuffling around the elements. Um, I did mention that some vector extensions will have integer multipliers as well. 
And if you are an assembly programmer, you will notice that normally multiply functions, um, if you multiply two 32 bit values, you get one 46 bit value because that's the precision you need to um, represent all the bits. If you have a vector multiply, you can see that the, the result vector has the same size and don't have more space, so you, you can actually. But you, what you could do is you could output two vectors, one with um, with, with promoted values, but what Perdix chose to do is that there are two multiply functions. One will have as result the upper 16 bits of the multiplication and one has the lower 16 bits. And this might seem really useless, but um, multiplication in integer uh, vector operations usually comes from stuff like integer effects 3D coding. And what they do is that they convert a code a floating point code that uses values between 1 and 0. And what you do is you represent this by omitting the, the, the leading 0 and just saving the, the most significant uh, fraction bits, fractional bits of the floating point code. And if you multiply those, um, you are only interested in the upper 60 bits in the end. So this actually makes sense in the practice, but it looks kind of ridiculous when you see it first. So, um, I hope you see that MMX does involve major bit fitting to get your algorithm translated into vectorized code. But even worse, there are many typical operations that are similar there for MMX. This is all for vector extensions. For example, taking the square root of something. Um, this is a bad example because it actually exists for, for vector extensions, but the, the, there are some really heavy function, for example, the uh, i387 or 78 does scene uh, and closing and logarithms and stuff like that in how gen. And um, you, have, you don't have that with vector extensions. I have a few integer tricks here that might come in handy. If you want to set the register to zero, all zero, the thing you need very often, um, this is you saw it with itself. This is something most internet programmers know because it saves space, you don't have to import the whole constant. With MMX it's even more important because if you have a vector, you need more for memory to have the constant zero. So this is more important for MMX. Um, but if you want to have a value that's all ones, the, the obvious step would be to set the register to zero and then subtract one. And there's normally there's an easy instruction for that. On the internet, but it doesn't work for MMX. So the, the trick we use here is to use a comparison function to compare a vector with a cell for equality, and the result will always be one. So the result vector will be all ones. And stuff like that. You, this is what makes um, simply hacking interesting. That normally you, you have a, an obvious and clear code you want to vectorize, but actually producing your formula in, in simply um, is challenging. Other interesting things I found out to exchange two vectors, you can sort them with each other three times. This is also well known in circles of old black stackers, for example. Um, it's not so important in practice, but how, how to calculate the absolute value of, of floats, for example, it doesn't work so easily on, on integers, but on floats. The, the first bit in the 32 bit IEEE representation is the sign bit, so to make it a floating point value, absolute value, you just reset the bit. And you do that by ending the element as integer with this constant. And how do you get that constant in the register? Um, you make an all one vector with a comparison trick, I told you, and then shift right by one. So you see there are lots of small tricks and um, funny ways to do stuff that you would normally do differently with Simbi. Um, imaging people often need the absolute sum of differences, I said that a few times, but there is no absolute value for integers by the way. So the solution is to calculate both the difference A minus B and B minus A, but with separation. I told you separation says an adequate don't go whiter than white, you don't wrap around. It's also true for, for um, subtracting. So if you subtract something and it's, it's going to be negative, the result is zero. So if you calculate both, 
one of them would be positive and the other would be zero. So if you all the results, you get the absolute value. This is kind of tricky again. And stuff like that, there are optimization methods from, from for the vector extended by the vendors and in, in those manuals you will find tricks like these. But it is um, interesting to write program like that. Um, yeah, what else? I told you SSE has wider vectors than MLX and uh, there's also one other difference for the first time on, on Intel architectures there's an alignment issue normally on Intel you, can, you don't have to care about the alignment it's only a performance problem but on, on SSE if you, if you load a um, 128 bit vector from an alignment position you get a set for the program that stops calling and um, there are two load instructions one that's fast and it has to have a proper alignment and one that is slow and that doesn't care about the alignment and the problem is that if you use GCC to write your SSD code um, then GCC normally uses lots of uh, virtual registers on the stack and, and writes values on the stack all the time unless you enable the optimizer and what happens is that GCC has a bug even in, in current versions um, that does not align these, these temporary stack register copies. So what happens if you if your program has a bug and you enable minus G and disable the optimizer is that all your SSE code will suddenly stop working. So this kind of problem you will still have because the two changes are kind of experimental right now. Um, don't be surprised as a longer. Uh, Low floating point vectors, I just said any integer vectors is quite easy because it doesn't cost any hardware, but floating point vectors do cost hardware. So you see diagrams these days of uh, vector extensions on CPUs, you see they use up quite some space and it's usually for the floating point stuff. Um, one interesting result of this is that you have more floating point units but they are tied to the vector expression set. So um, if you vectorize your code, the normal floating point unit is not used at all. So on, on some architectures you can actually be faster than normal vectorized code by interleaving the vector extension code with normal floating point code. Um, some of the, the floating point code is quite interesting because for example, um, there is a uh, free now and this is the instruction not to, there is a division instruction as well, but there also is an instruction to calculate the reciprocal of the value. And uh, the background is that, that multiplying is always much faster than dividing. So what they expect you to do is to use the reciprocal instruction and then multiply with that, and it's faster than using the divide instruction. So, there are lots of stuff like this you can find when you need the timing for the instructions in the manual. And another thing is square roots. Um, there is an instruction to get a square root, but you don't get a square root, but you get the rest of the square root. So um, this is because often you want to divide by the square root or something. Uh, if you really need the square root, you have to use the rest of the again. So the instruction sets are really interesting if you have some time to spend. This is very funny. I think I have to um, be very fast now. Um, there are some other problem cases in real life. For the most important example I found is one part of MPEG 4, where they want to find the best child um, in the neighborhood. So what they do is they compare the, the pixels in the neighborhood, but only um, not tile, not, not inside tiles, but it can also be that the vector is shifted one pixel to the left, for example, and then the leftmost pixel in the vector will leave the tile. And to reduce the memory pressure on hardware implementations, the standard says you don't use the next tile then for that pixel, but you have to reflect the vector at the border. This is absolutely impossible to, to do in as you can said by shuffling all the time. So there are many functions that could benefit greatly from vectorization, but uh, can't. Do it. One case study I would like to mention, I used to spend my time with the Warbus, uh, which is the, the audio part of Hot Warbus, and I used to come to find some lines of code that are executed particularly often. 
Um, I found about 10 hotspots in the psychological um, model code, and three of them, I think these very psychological, three of them look like that you could use vectors to, uh, to gain some speed here. I converted those three, and the speed level is still 25%. So you can, you can give you with minimal effort, this took about one week, and I didn't have any. The final message is, the final message is, if I can learn to see one so can you. And if you have any questions, please use email because I'm running out of time here. Or I, I will, can talk to you outside the table if you want. Um, if you want to learn about computer architecture in general, I suggest going to a bookstore and asking for the NC Patterson book. There are actually two books from those guys, one of them in the list, the other in the Spark, so those are really popular in Common March, and um, they have the best book on computer architecture. I'm going to vacate this spot now for the list. I hope you can eat that.